Grizzly Crimes from Past, Death and the Diet Doctor. His book was a bestseller. When the case came to court, it was found that eight out of the twelve women vetted for the jury had followed the Scarsdale diet. A feeble joke went the rounds when the murdered suspect was named. It was said that Mrs. Harriet had killed Dr. Tarnover because she failed to lose weight as promised. And at the autopsy, a fascinating statistics was revealed. Dr. Tarnover, 69, a moderately well-developed and well-nourished white man, measured 70 inches tall and weighted 175 pounds. By his own diet plan, the millionaire physician was 15 pounds overweight. Dr. Harman Tarnower, hi to his friends, lived in a fashionable section of New York's Westchester suburb. He helped to found a flourishing clinic in Scarsdale and there used to recommend a diet program for his overweight patients. Originally, the plan was no more than two pages long, but in 1979, the doctor published a greatly expanded version under the title of The Complete Scarsdale Medical Diet Lose 20 pounds in 14 days was the book's boast. Besides the initial basic plan, there were gourmet, international, vegetarian, and money-saving variations. Millions followed the diet and the doctor became world famous. Physically fit and active for his age, Tarnower had a taste for the good life. He enjoyed golf, fishing, travel to exotic places, and good eating too at the intimate dinner parties he gave at his Westchester home. A bachelor of long standing, Dr. Tarnower also enjoyed women. He had many casual affairs, but for some 14 years, the doctor had pursued a steady liaison with Mrs. Jean Harris, headmistress of the highly respectable Madaria Girls School in Virginia. It was a very adult relationship. Mrs. Harris was a divorcee whose own husband had died. She expressed no special jealousy about his philanderings, nor did she ask for marriage. Yet, she was hostess at his dinners. The couple shared foreign holidays and Mrs. Harris helped to edit the famous book. This civilized arrangement was jeopardized. However, where Lynn Triforos entered the scene, she was the doctor's nurse secretary at the clinic, an attractive young woman with whom Tarnower began to spend more and more time. In the year before the fatal event, for example, Dr. Tarnower took two winter holidays, the first at Palm Beach with the headmistress, the second in Jamaica with the nurse. In March 1980, the time of the shooting, Mrs. Harris was 56 and Lynn Triforos only 37. The swinging diet doc, as the press was to call him, was trying to jilt his long-standing mistress in favor of a replacement some 20 years younger. Nothing that emerged in the coming case could mask the essential callousness of the doctor's action. It was almost as he were trading a life rather than he might have traded an old car for a new model. Public sympathy heavily in favor of Mrs. Harris at the outset of the trial, and for feminists especially, she seemed to embody the whole plight of exploited womanhood. The trial was one of the longest ever held in the history of New York State, and amid all the courtroom wrangling, some facts were beyond dispute. On Monday 10th of March 1980, Mrs. Harris drove the 500 miles from Virginia to New York in a blue Chrysler which belonged to the school. She arrived at round 2300 on a stormy night and let herself into the house. With her, she took a 32 caliber Harrington and Richardson revolver, bought some 18 months earlier. Five of his six chambers were loaded. Five more rounds were on her person. She entered the doctor's bedroom while he slept, and in the period which followed, several shots were fired. The doctor received four bullet wounds from which he died within the hour. During the fracas, Tarnworth's cook heard the buzzer from the bedroom sounding in the kitchen. She rushed and picked up the receiver, heard a shot and much shouting and screaming. 
the cook woke her husband and called the police as Mrs. Harris left the house. A police officer in the neighborhood drove to the scene and saw the blue Chrysler ahead. Mrs. Harris did a U-turn in the road and went back to the house with the police car following behind. Hurry up, hurry up, he's been shot, she said to the officer. Tarno was crumpled on the bedroom floor when they arrived. His pajamas drenched in blood. He died in hospital. The statements Mrs. Harris made on the fateful night included, I've been through so much hell with him. I loved him very much. He slept with every woman he could find and I had it. She said she had come to the house with the intention of committing suicide. There had been a struggle with the gun, which went up several times. Asked who had control of the weapon and who did the shooting, she said, I don't know. I remember holding the gun and shooting him in the hand. Mrs. Harris was brought on trial on a murder charge. The hearing began on October 1980, by which time the case was already a cause celebre, and it was five weeks before the trial paper began with the full complement of jurors, eight women, four men, agreed on by both sides. Mrs. Harris pleaded not guilty, her counsel claiming, We don't want special sympathy because she is a woman, because of her age, because she is frail. The defense asked for no mitigations on ground of temporary insanity or diminished responsibility. Its case rested squarely on the contention that the defendant went to Westchester to take her own life and the doctor died in a tragic accident. Formidable obstacles were ranged against this version of the event. For example, if suicide were her intention, why did Mrs. Harris take a loaded revolver and carry spare rounds on her person? In fact, by a legal nicety, the prosecution was forbidden to mention that she had much more ammunition in the car. Then there was the struggle itself. How come the doctor sustained four bullet wounds and Mrs. Harris none at all? The defense marshaled plenty of evidence to show that Mrs. Harris had been feeling suicidal. She had been taking drug prescribed by Dr. Tarnwar to combat depression. She had recently been facing problem at her school and she had left several farewell notes to friends and colleagues before the fateful night. One said, I wish to be immediately cremated and thrown away. Another included the sad reflection, I was a person and no one ever knew. Briefly, her own account of events, which she had arrived and found turnover in bed. Jesus, he had said, is the middle of the night and he told her to go away. She asked for a chance to talk for a little while and he refused. Wandering into the bathroom, Mrs. Harris saw a greenish-blue satin negligee belonging to her rival. She went back into the bedroom and threw it to the floor. Returning to the bathroom, she picked up a box of curlers and hurled them at the window. Tarnower came to the bathroom and hit her across the face. Her mouth was bruised when the police found her. She threw another box and Tarnower hit her again. Back in the bedroom, she sat on the bed saying, Hit me again. Haim, make it hard enough to kill. Then unzipping her bag, she took out the gun. Never mind, she said. I'll do it myself. By her account, Mrs. Harris raised the gun to her head and as she squeezed the trigger, he pushed it away. The shot exploded. Tarnawar withdrew his hand and it was covered with blood. Jesus Christ, he said. Look what you did. In a struggle that followed, Tarnawar prized the gun off her. Pressing the buzzer with his left hand, the gun lay briefly on the bed. Mrs. Harris lunged for it and felt what she thought was the muzzle pressing into her abdomen. Again, she pulled the trigger. There was a second explosion and Tarnower fell back. Now she held the gun to her head and pulled the trigger, but it only clicked. She tried again and a wild shot ricocheted somewhere. She put the gun to her head and I shot and I shot and I shot. But the gun just went on clicking. Back in the bathroom, she banged the weapon repeatedly against the hub, trying to empty the chambers, planning to reload. In the end, the gun just broke. 
Tarnower was still conscious and she didn't realize he was dying as she ran out to find help. She was driving to a nearby phone booth when the police car appeared with its flashing light. Spotting it, she U-turned to lead it back to the house. Incredibly complex ballistic evidence was heard at the trial. With abstruse talk about ricochet points, in and out gunshot wounds and so on. Additionally, it was shown that the police had behaved with some carelessness in handling the material evidence. Suffice to say that four bullet wounds were found in the doctor's body and Mrs. Harris could only remember three shots being fired. This tended to weigh against her. But it was easy to imagine in the heat of the struggle, more shots might have been fired without murderous intent. Ultimately, the ballistics evidence was inconclusive. It was in essence a psychological drama. Mrs. Harris was something of an enigma, even to the partition of her claws. Small, attractive, and neatly turned out, she was very composed in the dock. She showed no apparent remorse for the death of her long-standing lover, and even handled the blood-stained sheets without visible emotion. Sometimes, she was petulant with the prosecutor. Constantly, she could be seen forwarding notes to her own defense counsel. Hers was a sharp mind. She looked neither frail, aged, nor abandoned, nor did she look like a victim. The defense stressed her suicidal wariness, claiming that no vengeful feelings had motivated her as she drove to Westchester that night. There was no hatred for Tarnower in her soul, only a mortal exhaustion. They had never quarreled before. She quipped in the box, except over the correct use of the subjunctive. But one piece of the evidence weighted massively against her version of events. It came to be known as the Scarsdale Letter. It was a very long and very angry letter mailed by Mrs. Harris on the very morning of the fateful day. It was sent to Tarnower by registered post and recovered from the mail. And the text was one long shriek of outrage against the wrongs she had endured. Mrs. Harris claimed in the letter that Tarnower had cut her out of his will in favor of Lynn Triforos. She called her rival a vicious, adulterous, psychotic, and a self-serving, ignorant slut. The headmistress charged Lyne with ripping up dresses from her wardrobe at Tarnower's house. She suspected her of stealing her jewelry too, and of making anonymous phone calls. The whole tone of the letter was ugly, betraying a violent intensity of emotions. Mrs. Harris's central demand was that she'd be allowed to spend April 19th with Tarnower. That was an important occasion at which the doctor was to be honored. Mrs. Harris was determined to attend even if the slot comes. Indeed, I don't care if she pops naked out of a cake with her tits frosted with chocolate. This from the headmistress of the Madeira Girls School. The letter undermined all the character witnesses who had been brought from the school to the courtroom. But it did much more. It demonstrated unequivocally that jealousy and rage was burning in her soul. In the box, the prosecutor had asked, Do you ever consider yourself publicly humiliated by the fact that Dr. Tarnover was seeing Lyne try for us in public? She had replied no. Yet, in the letter, she had written, I have been publicly humiliated again and again and again. The defense had refused to plead for leniency on the ground of diminished responsibility. They had decided to go for the complete acquittal on the tragic accident theory, and it now seemed a hindsight, a downright mistake. The prosecution described a phone call from the doctor on the fateful morning. God damn it, Jean, stop bothering me, he had said. And this, it was alleged, was a triggering incident which caused her to take the revolver, the many rounds of ammunition, and head the Brook Chrysler to Westchester. No doubt she did intend suicide, but she intended to kill the doctor first. At the end of a trial lasting nearly a year, the jury delivered its verdict, and it agreed with the prosecution. On 24th February 1981, Mrs. Harris was found guilty 
of the murder charge. She displayed no reaction, but the two defense lawyers burst into tears when the result was announced. The verdict carried an automatic jail sentence of at least 15 years, which was duly delivered by the judge. Standing upright in the dock, Mrs. Harry replied with a lengthy statement beginning, I want to say that I did not murder Dr. Harmon Tarnower, that I loved him very much, and I never wished him ill, and I am innocent as I stand here. She was sent to Bedford Hills Correctional Facility in Westchester. In December 1981, the Times reported that Mrs. Harris has abandoned the Scarsdale diet and had gained 30 pounds on prison food. Almost 70 years old when she got out in 1993. She tried to live out of the limelight, despite the occasional made-for-TV movie or book about the case. She devoted herself to gardening outside her cabin on the Connecticut River in New Hampshire, writing and taking walks with her golden retriever, Lainey, who was named after a nun who directed the prison's children's center. Harris died of natural cause on December 23, 2012, at an assisted living center in New Haven, Connecticut, at age 89. Thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed this story, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment as it helps with YouTube algorithm to grow this channel. You will find similar contents in my other videos. Have a safe day. Signing off.